Okay, so this is 7.2, uh, economic sectors and patterns. So uh, this is looking at the different, how we kind of classify different parts of the economy. Uh, and then the patterns uh, is gonna be like where uh, manufacturing is located around the world and why it's located in different areas. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. I do have my stopwatch going, trying for 15 minutes. So here we go. Uh, here's the, the kind of what we're gonna be doing. So. Uh, again, we're looking at different economic sectors, and so these are them, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, which is just a funny word to say, uh, and quinary. Uh, and so we'll, we'll identify those and then look at uh, all of these factors in determining why manufacturing is located where it, where it is. And so these, con these terms, core, semi-periphery, and periphery, can't draw a straight line, uh, we're going to get more into that in a couple of sections. So uh, sit tight on that. It kind of means most developed, middle developed, and less developed, but uh, not quite. So we'll, we'll hone in on that a little bit more. All right. Uh, so when we look at the different economic sectors, uh, we break this down. And so general, this is traditionally uh, how it's been broken down. And so they, they've kind of started to mess around with a little bit, uh, coming up with new things. And so generally in the past, uh, we have the primary sector, which is, you know, it's all the raw materials. We'll talk in a little bit more in depth in just a second. Uh, secondary sector is the manufacturing of stuff. And then tertiary sector is services. Uh, and again, they've come in and put this quaternary and quinary, and we'll, we'll explain what that is in just a second. But so this is traditional. Uh, and these, you know, different people will argue that, hey, these two should actually be in this tertiary sector. But don't worry, you know, it, it's not the big deal. Uh, so let's take a look. <clears throat> So the primary sector is uh, the production of raw materials. So this is getting stuff out of the ground uh, or out of the sea or you know wherever. Uh, and so when we look at these things, it can be agriculture, so crops and livestock, uh, forestry, so the picture of forestry there, mining, uh, that would be an example of mining there, uh, fishing, fisheries, that kind of stuff. And then, so this was the agriculture, and then min mineral extraction, so things like oil. And so again, it, it is, pulling out all of these natural resources or getting the natural resources, the raw materials. Uh, it, it, that's what makes up the primary sector. Generally speaking, developing countries, so the poorer countries, are a lot of their uh, ec economics, uh, their, their output, economic output, is derived from primary sector. It's not completely by any stretch. We'll see a map in a bit. Uh, most of it's actually services for, for most countries. But generally speaking, uh, poorer countries are, have a higher percentage of their economic output in these raw materials, okay? Because a lot of it has to do with the technology available because the, today's manufacturing is obviously more uh, high level. And so the availability of that kind of technology uh, is, is one of those, those things that play into it. So uh, anyway, that doesn't mean that wealthy countries don't have this. They certainly do. Look at the U.S. Uh, we got all of this stuff. So uh, anyway. So that's primary. The secondary is the manufacturing of these raw materials into a finished product. And so all these are just different manufacturing processes. Here's a, uh, a line, assembly line, uh, manufacturing computer stuff, sewing machines there. Uh, this is roasting the coffee. So this is taking the raw bean and then roasting it into something and converting it into, you know, your, your uh, Dutch bros cup of coffee. Never had it, but... Well, at some point. Uh, so anyway, so that's what secondary is, just the manufacturing. And so we've seen this kind of shift around the world a bit. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, China wasn't the world's biggest manufacturer. Today, uh, they, they manufacture a bunch. Uh, and so, and we'll look at why, why manufacturing shifts from one place to the other. Uh, and you'll hear a lot about people saying, hey, the U.S. doesn't make anything anymore. We're actually going to see that that's not quite true. We actually still do produce quite a bit. Uh, we rank second. Uh, behind China. So uh, anyway, so that's secondary. And then tertiary, this is all the services, okay? And so this is people that, that provide a service. There's no physical production of anything. It's not taking raw materials and converting it into anything, but uh, it is the physical, it is the, the it, it involves services. And so here you can see uh, a barber, uh, nurses, you know, electricians, any anything like that where nothing's physically produced. Here's a teacher. I thought that was a pretty funny cartoon. Thought it was worth putting in there. Uh, but you know, so a lawyer could be would be a service. A doctor would be a service. Uh, electrician, construction worker. I mean, all these kind of things. They they're not taking raw materials and converting it into something. And so this is the majority 
definitely of the US economy, but of, of most countries' economies around the world. Uh, and, and again, we'll see a map in just a second. And so, you know, the, the debate now gets into, <clears throat> and we'll look at this, uh, we have, so this is a little bit bigger pyramid, we're still missing one here, uh, but now we have this quaternary. Uh, and so just remember, you know, this is kind of the traditional three, uh, but AP, which is why you're watching this video, uh, AP does like this, this term quaternary and quinary. Uh, so let's look at, at what those two are. So quaternary sector uh, is an information or knowledge-based sector. So think about uh, somebody who's, who becomes uh, a computer programmer uh, or somebody who goes to college and gets a, a master's degree in chemistry uh, and, and does a lot of research. It's that kind of stuff. It's, again, information or knowledge base. So this would be a computer programmer. This is a research and development here. This is a data analyst. And so that would be another example. So it's, it's a high level of knowledge that would, that would be part of this sector. Okay, and not all countries have this because of the level of technology that's needed. If you're a very poor country, you don't have the technology available for a lot of this stuff. Not all, but you know, uh, for for the big kind of stuff, the big kind of research and stuff, uh, developing com countries just don't have it. So, uh, think about like information and communication technologies, uh, research and development. So, that's what we mean by quaternary. But you can see uh, if we're talking about services, you know, if we broadly define that, then that is, you know, you, you can see why some people would put it in uh, that tertiary sector. Uh, so that's that one. And then quinary, and this is kind of this kind of new. Uh, this group is comprised of the people who are kind of the big decision makers in in the country. And so this can be politicians. This can be head of corporations. Uh, it can be head of uh, companies that, that do a lot of research and development, stuff like that. And so people that have their, their decisions and their insights have a big, broad impact. And so obviously, you know, the president and vice president, they are, here's Elon Musk uh, with kind of a funny look. Uh, and this is a guy named Jack Ma, uh, who is in uh, China, uh, uh, started a company called Alibaba. Uh, but if you know him, then you know his story, but uh, now's not the time. Uh, but anyway, so <clears throat> all of these people, the, the decisions that they make have a big impact. And so that's what they mean by quinary sector. All right. Uh, and so you can see this is a map of the leading economic sectors in different countries. And for the most part, services dominate. All right. Now, the poor countries, uh, the agriculture will be higher, be a higher percentage. Uh, but you can see most services. And so uh, if we look at some of these countries in Africa, you know, there's a few there where uh, agriculture or industry is the biggest one. Uh, there's North Korea where industry is the biggest one, uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, and so you can kind of pick these out on the map, but clearly services are, are the biggest for most countries. But yeah, I'll leave it at that. Eight minutes. All right. So uh, the location of manufacturing. And so now we want to take a look at why businesses decide to locate where they locate you know uh tennis shoe companies uh, a lot of them are, are manufactured in china you know and why does nike decide hey let's put a manufacturing facility in china uh or lots and lots of other companies uh lots of other american companies uh putting their their manufacturing overseas and so that's what this is about you know where is it why did they put it there and why is that important all righty so when we look at manufacturing around the world uh, there are several things, obviously, uh, that, that help determine where those locations are. And so these are kind of the big three. One thing is they're going to look at the cost of labor. Uh, and that's one of the reasons China was able to grow so much. They had a very low cost of labor, and that is changing a bit. Uh, the innovation in transportation, how, how quick and easy and cheap is it to transport whatever products you have? And then how close are you to the market that you want to sell it to? And is that going to be a, is that a big factor? Because sometimes uh, this innovation in transportation can help outweigh how close you are to the market. And it depends on, again, how, how expensive it is to get it to the market. Uh, those aren't the only things. Uh, here's a couple of others, other things that companies look at. Is the workforce educated? Is there political stability in the country? Uh, you know, is somebody going to take over the country and nationalize all the industries and take over the, the businesses that are there? Uh, what are the tax rates? Whoops, sorry about that. 
Uh, what kind of tax rates are in the country? This is the reason that some country, some companies leave the U.S., lo pay lower taxes. Uh, what are the environmental laws like? You know, if it's a con if it's a, a company that uh, might be a bigger pollutant uh, to the to the environment, then they might look and say, okay, well, we can go to this other country and not have to worry as much about our carbon imprint or carbon footprint. All right. So take a look at this. Uh, this is manufacturing superpowers top 10 countries by share of global manufacturing 2018 so you can see china is the biggest and we are the second biggest okay so we we do produce things here uh you know so if, if you hear that the, the the line that hey we don't produce things in the u.s anymore it's not quite right uh japan germany south korea and so these are all the really big wealthy countries uh you know and so manufacturing is a huge driver even though services you know take up a big chunk of the economy clearly manufacturing is a big part of it and this is coming up 2025 the fastest 10 countries for growth uh so the, these are the economies they expect to grow a lot by 2025 so this is where you would start to expect to see manufacturing and if you start looking in your closet you're going to see clothes made in vietnam uh, Pakistan, a lot of these countries are going to start showing up in some of the products that you buy, and that's for a reason. So uh, you can see here is the percentage of growth. Vietnam's growing fast. Uh, India's growing fast. And so, you know, the, and it, it's, it's for these reasons that we're about to talk about. Uh, this is, so labor is one of those things. Uh, this is labor market risk. I won't spend much time on this, but, you know, so uh, the zero to 25 lowest risk. So if, if you're a company, you want to go you want to avoid risk you know companies are risk averse and so they will tend to locate uh, not always but tend to locate in countries where there is much less risk now depending on the cost of labor and other things they may take the risk but you can see that the u.s uh, would be a very low risk place uh, mexico is still a very low risk place and so you kind of get the idea these countries with a high risk you know companies aren't going to locate there because there's, there's, they don't like the idea of risk. You're not going to put, you know, a, a $50 million facility in a place that, that's, that's risky. Okay. Uh, and then finally, this is uh, wages in different countries. And this is just an index. So this, these numbers don't mean uh, like dollars or anything. This is, if this is the baseline, how much did they go up? And so you can see China's uh, wages have actually gone up a lot, which is making them a bit less competitive for certain industries. And so that's one of the reasons why we're seeing Vietnam become uh, grow faster, because as the wages go up in China, they say, look, we can just move our manufacturing to other places. Uh, and so if you look here, uh, you know, India, very low risk. So that would be a, a place that, that uh, countries might locate. And so, you know, wages definitely have a lot to do with it. You can see Canada, South Korea, the U.S., Germany, you know, the wages haven't gone up a ton. So this would be uh, for Canada, maybe 35 percent, something like that uh, for the U.S. And this is what they call real wages. You know, you're the purchasing power of your wage. Uh, and so the U.S. wages have stayed pretty flat for the last 20 years. And that's that's not good, actually. So uh, not good for the, the workers. Uh, last little bit, manufacturing cost competitiveness. And so again, this is if you're a, 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 a corporation and you're trying to figure out where do I need, where do I want to go to locate, you are looking for countries. One of the things that you look at is that, you know, where is it cheap to manufacture your stuff? And so take a look at the U.S. We're actually, you know, ranking pretty well here. We're in the second tier. Uh, and so, you know, this is, this is good because companies may say, well, let's just go, you know, build in the U.S., uh, even though we might have higher labor costs, the overall manufacturing costs uh, might it, are, are competitive. And one of the big reasons is uh, productivity per worker in the U.S. Uh, so anyway, we'll get into that. All right. So the last big chunk of this is uh, this thing called the least cost theory. All right. And so this applies for manufacturing location. This is done by a guy named Alfred Weber. Uh, and he tried to figure out why are countries locating or why are companies, I'm sorry, locating where they are. And so... He said a lot of it had to do with transportation cost, all right? And so the idea was companies are going to locate where it is cheapest to produce. And so since raw materials and markets don't, aren't always at the same place, often not, they're going to say, okay, where can we locate our factory to make it cheap to bring the raw materials to us and relatively cheap to send that product out to the market, all right? And so... 
and we'll, we'll look at a diagram here in just a second. And so a couple of terms that kind of go along with this is one is the market. Uh, so is the industry, what they call material oriented. Uh, and this is the other phrase, and this is one of the AP terms. It, it, is it bulk reducing? Meaning, you know, if you take the raw material and think about, uh, you know, like iron ore, you know, something that would be extremely hard to transport long distances. And so you're going to take this, uh, this raw product and you're going to produce it very close to where it's extracted. And then you will start to, sh to make, when you turn it into your finished product, it gets in smaller and smaller chunks and that makes it cheaper to ship uh, to, to the market. Okay, and so you start with a big product, the, the big raw material here, and then you start developing it and manufacturing it, and you turn it into a bunch of smaller products, and then it's easier to ship these smaller products to where you want them to go, all right? And that's what they mean by bulk reducing, taking something big and then making it smaller through the, the process of manufacturing. The opposite of that is what they call bulk gaining, okay, or the market-oriented manufacturing. So this is when you take the finished product uh, and the finished product keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Think about the building of a car. You know, you start with all the individual pieces and then suddenly you got a, a, a big big product. And so that would be the idea of, of bulk gaining. And so you need to figure out, you know, how expensive is it to ship this product? And so, you know, if, if, if you're doing the bulk gaining like the car, you might produce closer to the market that you're selling it at because it might be cheaper to get all those smaller inputs into the, the facility, all right? Uh, and the other thing that, that Weber talked about is uh, this in his least cost theory is that companies will agglomerate, all right? Uh, and that is where they will, competing companies uh, within the same industry will often be in the same place because that is, uh, they can share some of the, the, the bigger infrastructure costs uh, together. And so uh, that would be a way for them to minimize their each their individual costs. Okay, so agglomeration uh, is when the, they cluster together. And so that's kind of the, the key word there. righty. And so again, that's least cost theory. So where do you put your manufacturing facility based on the cost of transportation of the raw materials and on the cost of transportation of the finished product? All right. And so this is what it kind of looks like. And so Let's pretend that uh, we have a factory and there's two products that go into this factory, uh, material A and material B. We'll just call this, you know, gold and silver, whatever they're producing. And so we've got a silver mine over here and we have a gold mine over here and we have the market up here. And so the least cost theory says, look, uh, it is going to be costliest to ship gold. All right. And so they want to locate closer to this place. All right, uh, the second costliest is to ship the silver. And so they can be a little bit farther away. And then here's the market. And so it's cheap to get it to market. So think if they're making, you know, jewelry, uh, it's, it's cheaper to ship, to, to be closer to those two. So this would be a bulk reducing, uh, cheaper to be closer to the, the raw materials and then send those smaller products on. Uh, here's an ethanol plant. Ethanol comes from uh, corn. And it is used in gasoline. If, you, if you're at the gas station, you'll see this contains 10% ethanol, something like that. And so take a look at where this plant's located. Uh, these would be cornfields, you know. Uh, so they often locate these uh, plants close to the plants. See what I did there? Uh, they, they often locate these manufacturing facilities close to the raw material. And so you can see, you know, and one thing that I want you to notice is there's a train here. All right, and so this is, again, a bulk reducing thing. So they get all this corn and they turn it into ethanol that we can put in our car and then they will send it on the train and send it on its way. All righty. Uh, the other last term uh, that, that you need to be familiar with is this term called break of bulk. All right, and this is the different when the, when the shipping mode uh, changes. You know, so if you're trans, transporting your product and think of all the different ways that it gets shipped. So let's say that you start on a container ship and it goes there, they unload the container ship and here's a container and they put it on, you know, a semi, something like that. Uh, this would be putting those containers on a train. That's a break of bulk. So going from this to this would be the break of bulk. Uh, and then, you know, if this is a truck being towed on a train, always kind of fun. Uh, and then it goes to the prime, you know, to the, the, the smaller delivery truck. So all of those are break of bulk. 
Uh, I did throw this picture in there. You all are familiar with that. Uh, the big cargo ship in the Suez Canal called the Ever Given. Then somebody, uh, this, I had a lot of fun with this. So somebody created an app to where you could put the ship and its relative size uh, on a map. And so this is what it would look like if the Ever Given, which was the one that was stuck, uh, was parked at UHS. Kind of funny. All right, and then this is the last thing, uh, the, the map of shipping uh, across the world. Just wanted to get a sense for it. And so wherever the, the lines are darkest, uh, and just to give you an idea, so here's the US, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, here's the US, you know, here's South America, uh, Africa here. It's kind of tough to make out the land and, and not. So obviously the darker the red, uh, the more the more shipping uh, is coming from there. So. Uh, this would be where the Suez Canal is. So take a look at all of that. You know, this is why that, that ship getting stuck was a big deal because it blocked all of that up. Alrighty. So that's it. Let me check my time. 20 minutes. Take coming. Five minutes long. Alrighty. I'll take care.